summers. Um, and you can find more information about this Celebrating Bar Talk series um, on our website, and you can access recordings of previous programs at historicsaranaclake.org uh, slash celebrating dash bar talk. So I'll be sure to put that link in the chat uh, before the end of the program. Before uh, we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Peter Lackey is a visiting professor of music at Bard College and is the author of numerous musicological articles. He served as the editor of Bartok and His World, a collection of essays and documents published for the Bard Music Festival. He writes program notes for many orchestras and performing arts organizations around the country and has lectured at many international conferences. Uh, I do want to note, as you just heard, this presentation is being recorded, so it will be available on the museum's YouTube channel, and I will also send the link out to that recording to everyone who registered. I do recommend that everyone stays muted uh, during the course of the presentation until the Q&A at the end, at which point you can unmute to ask a question, or if you'd prefer, you can type your question into the chat and we will read it aloud. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Peter. Well, thank you so much, Mihaela and Amy, for this kind invitation. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you about Bar Talk, about whom I'm sure you know a great deal already, uh, as you are involved with the Bar Talk cabin and then the Saranac, where, where his memory is being kept alive. So I wasn't quite sure uh, uh, how, how much. Uh, to say or, or how to say this, but, but I just uh, remember the time when I was visiting there and, and I was imagining that Bartok uh, was there. I'm kind of uh, uh, retracing his steps and just trying to imagine what it might have looked like when, uh, when this reclusive man, slightly built with gray hair, uh, showed up in town uh, staying at Mrs. Margaret Sageman's cottage, uh, spoke very little, spent most of his time working, except when he took long walks in the foothills of the Adirondacks. So what did people make of him at the time? Did they know who he was? Did they know that he was an internationally celebrated composer, pianist, and ethnomusicologist, counted among the most important living musicians worldwide? Did they know then in 1940 uh, that he had left his native country at the age of 59, immigrated to the United States where he was relatively little known, cut off from family and friends in dire financial straits because of his inability to receive any royalties for his work from Europe due to the war? They probably didn't know any of this. And they certainly couldn't know what he himself didn't know because his doctors didn't tell him that he was suffering from leukemia, the disease that would claim his life in 1945. But even if they had known any of this, they probably wouldn't have had the proper context to appreciate what Hungary, that small country in faraway Central Europe may have meant for Bartók. They, they must have known from the papers that Hungary was fighting on Hitler's side in World War II and might have deduced from that that Bartók's very presence in the United States was a sign of his antagonism to Nazi Germany. But Hungarian culture, especially the folk music to the study of which Bartók has devoted his entire adult life would have been as far from them as the moon. But even so, the presence of this distinguished gentleman who came to Saranac under the sponsorship of ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, certainly did not go unnoticed in the town. When Bartók first came to Saranac in 1943, he had a lot of work to do. He had just received a commission from Serge Kusevitsky, the conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, to write a major work for the orchestra's upcoming season. This was going to be his first composition since his arrival in this country three years prior. The commission literally gave him a new lease on life. His fevers subsided. He started putting back on some of the weight he had lost. He knew that this composition was going to be one of the most important in his life. 
one that would not only confirm his status in the United States, but also represent the new artistic phase he was entering. Because he was entering a new artistic phase that sadly was not to fully unfold. What kind of work is this concerto for orchestra? I'm sure you know it very well. It is now one of his most favorite and most popular compositions. But you have to realize that it is really quite unlike anything Bartok had written before. It is more classical and more autobiographical than his previous works. I call it more classical because it was as close as Bartok ever got to write, writing a real symphony. And its harmonies were more consonant, its themes more singable than those in many of his earlier instrumental compositions. The title Concerto for Orchestra was chosen to recognize the fact that he was giving virtuosic solo parts to every single instrument or group of instruments in the orchestra. And it was more autobiographical because it is filled with allusions to other works and even works by other composers, which is rather unusual for Bartók. There are occasional examples of such quotes and allusions in his earlier music, but the case of the concerto is much more complex and also more revealing than anything we find in his other works. Its basic structure, the five movement outline itself is reminiscent of a very little known early work, is suite number one written in 1903, which was written long before he found his personal voice as a composer. But in a way, Bartók was reconnecting with his younger self from 40 years earlier, realizing the same five movement symphonic idea from the vantage point of his fullest maturity. And there are other connections with Bartók's past as well. The folk music allusions are there, of course, but they're more indirect. Now the mere use of the pentatonic scale and of the interval of the perfect fourth, which underlies so many Hungarian folk songs, is enough to conjure up association with folk music. So if you remember the concerto for orchestra, it's like all these perfect fourths, they occur in a lot of Hungarian folk songs. This is not a Hungarian folk song though, but it just conjures up that atmosphere. It makes you think of that. And only someone who had collected and transcribed uh, thousands of folk melodies would be able to come up with such an opening theme. Uh, but folk music is not the only thing Bartók references here. He also makes allusions to his own earlier music, as for instance, in the third movement, the elegy, where um, I don't know if you noticed this, he recalls a dramatic moment from his only opera, Duke Bluebeard's Castle, written back in 1911. And in that opera, uh, you know, Judith uh, opens each of the seven secret doors in Bluebeard's Castle discovering both the glorious and the dark sides of his past. She confronts behind the sixth door, the lake of tears, a body of still water that frightens her by its immobility. And since the elegy in the concerto for orchestra by general consensus expresses the composer's homesickness for Hungary, the near quote of the lake of tears conveys the immense sadness he must have felt at the prospect of perhaps never seeing his homeland again. And in fact, he never did see it again. So, uh, Mahela, can, can you play the music? Let's see if we can hear it. First, the concerto for orchestra, uh, the third movement. And... Uh, Oh. 
Okay. Well, okay. I don't know how well you could hear it. The point is the harp. It's very eerie, uh, unsettling sounds. And this comes right out of Bluebeard's castle, the Lake of Tears, which is always still a motionless water surface, which you know, the water is made up of the tears of all the former wives of Bluebeard. Now can we have that just just a just a few seconds from the Lake of Tears? Uh huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Angela. We can turn it off. You, you can you can hear it's almost the same thing. And I don't know how well you could hear it in this uh, transmission on on your uh, home computers. But the the point is clear. Yeah, yeah this, this this tragic water uh, is remembered in the concerto for orchestra and it's it's really a, a lake of tears so uh this is uh, certainly uh, a sign of his homesickness but this is the third movement of the concerto the slow movement the elegy but the most interesting case is the fourth movement which is called the intermezzo interrotto or interrupted intermezzo which is only four minutes long. It's the shortest movement in the piece, but it has so many layers of illusions and, um, and, and quotes that it's, it's really like an X-ray image of the emotions he was going through at the time. So, so, the, so first we, we have a, a rondo theme, which is kind of a refrain that keeps coming back. That is the intermezzo that is going to be interrupted. So if you can just hear just the very beginning of, of the movement, which is the intermezzo theme. I, if we can go to the fourth movement theme, the next musical excerpt. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so this carefree, little, playful oboe, it is kind of a very playful and very uh, light-hearted melody. So, we are set up for something very light and a little intermezzo between two heavier movements. But it's not going to stay that light because uh, this intermezzo is going to be interrupted. And what is going to interrupt this intermezzo? This is the first one. And uh, uh, before you play it, I tell you what, what this is from. This is uh, rather unusual uh, because this is an operetta melody. And uh, operetta is a genre that most people think was beneath Bartók, who was a master of musical modernism. And what could he possibly have had to do with operetta? And yet, there it is, a thinly disguised quote from a melody written by operetta composer Zsigmond Vince. Uh, I'm going to put his name here in the chat. Not very well known outside Hungary, 1922. And, and it goes, goes like this. This is a very famous baritone from the interwar era, uh, Imre Paolo, who is singing it for us. <laughs> Oh. 
Okay. Oh, is he for January, Vaj Major or Sag? January, Vinton, Vaj Vilag. Lovely, isn't it? Uh, and then we hear this in the Bato Concerto for Orchestra in this form, slightly transformed, but still recognizable. Yeah, then the next one. Okay, so, so it's okay, thank you. So it, it it's uh, it's really the same. It's not the same, but it's the same. Stay for junior evil major sack. It just made it slightly irregular with some extra notes and uh, mixed meters and uh, things like that, but it's really easily recognizable. And also it stands out so strongly from the previous melody and so much more romantic, really audibly romantic, that we know that something must be going on. And what is that something going on? You are beautiful, you are splendid, hungry. I mean, it, it doesn't take a lot to imagine that this is another expression of his homesickness. So uh, this is the first interruption. And, and then the original intermezzo returns, and then the second interruption comes, which is even more striking than the first. And this is where things get a little complicated. So you have to imagine uh, July 19th, 1942, Bartok and his wife Ditta and son Peter are sitting at home in New York, listening to the radio broadcast of the world premiere of Dmitry Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, the Leningrad, with the NBC Symphony Orchestra conducted by Arturo Toscanini. And this is, of course, described in Peter Bartok's book, My Father, which many of you have read. So, so here they are sitting at home listening to the radio and uh, Shostakovich uh, Leningrad Symphony was all the rage it was already famous it was written about in the newspapers and Shostakovich was on the title page of Time magazine uh, they knew that uh, this uh, symphony had been performed during the blockade of Leningrad under really terribly hard circumstances the score was smuggled out of Russia under extremely dramatic uh, circumstances, and there was a whole movie made about it and how how they they sent the score to America in the middle of World War II. So there was there was a big hoopla about this piece. So Batok is sitting there listening with great anticipation, and then he hears this. Let's uh, go to the. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mahela. That's not it. Okay. Thank you. So, so what is it? Do do bum 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 and so if when you listen to this symphony in its entirety, this melody is repeated and repeated and repeated, and it gets louder and louder and even louder, and it goes like this for almost 10 long minutes. 10 minutes, that's a long time. So Peter Bartok recalled in, in his book, his father said, it is not just that repetition of a theme so many times, is excessive under any conditions, but of such a theme, of, of such a theme. Okay, so what uh, what is that theme like? I mean, it does sound a little trivial. So what 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 is going on? And Bato couldn't believe his ears. Uh, what he couldn't know, however, was why Shostakovich did this. Uh, the Shostakovich symphony made international headlines, as I said, just because of the political situation, but very few people asked any musical questions about it, so what was going on uh, musically speaking. So uh, we now know that the incessant repetitions of this theme were supposed to represent the advancement of the Nazi army on Russian territory. But this was not known at the time. All Bato could hear was the crudeness of this theme. I mean, it's really like, uh, like a cliche. And he couldn't reconcile that with Shostakovich's high notoriety. After all, he was a very famous composer. So he didn't know what to make of it, but he was, he was a bit upset. Uh, so he reacted by inserting a cruel parody of this at the second interruption of this intermezzo in the fourth movement of concerto for orchestra. So now we can hear that excerpt. <laughs> Okay, so you, you see what's, what's going on. It, it's really uh, very funny. The accompaniment evokes a barrel organ, suggesting trivial primitive music. And the tune is interrupted by what is obviously musical laughter with the added effect of a comical trombone glissando. <laughs> So it's like circus music almost, like we're at a circus. So if the intermezzo was first interrupted by a nostalgic memory, the second interruption is a rude awakening. And here we suddenly realize that even though Barto couldn't have known what exactly Shostakovich had meant, he grasped his Russian colleague's message intuitively. Anyone who had ears could guess or could have had they stopped had, had they thought of asking the question that the extraordinary crescendo in the Shostakovich that which gets louder and louder uh, could only mean one thing an impending catastrophe because then it explodes at the end of the 10 minutes it explodes in a like a horrible like cacophony and uh, but the, certainly had ears and he understood that on an intuitive level. And then for all the parodying that he indulged in, he kept Shostakovich's essential message, the interruption of peaceful existence unchanged. Because you go to the Shostakovich, it really starts very peacefully, like life was good and peaceful until this invasion. And then uh, the peaceful 
existence is interrupted, just as in the Bartok, da -da 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 is interrupted. So, uh, so that is what the trivial melody does in Shostakovich, and that is exactly what its parody does in Bartok as well, coming right after and in a sense negating the nostalgic song about the hope about the homeland. So we first had a nostalgic memory, and then we have this crude parody of uh, some, something something bad happening. Uh, but you know, but there's even more in this because there's another melody here. Uh, some people have offered another source for, for this. It could have come from Shostakovich. It could have come from Lehár, Franz Lehár, a famous Hungarian-born operetta composer. And this time, we're talking about a famous piece, not an obscure one like, like Vince, right from Hamburg. We're talking about Lehár's hit, The Merry Widow from 1905, in which the male lead sings his entrance song, Da Geich ins Maxim, and I go to Maxim's. Uh, and what, what is he talking about? He's an officer who doesn't like to serve his country. He much prefers the company of pretty girls. And that's what he sings about. OK, so uh, if we can have that. Uh, Extra. The next, yeah, next one. Okay, so you see the same melody. Uh, the same thing. Maybe Shostakovich got, got it from Lehar also. That is possible if he wanted to give the enemy's melody a Germanic slant. Uh, there are no definite answers to these questions, but uh, it is intriguing that we have two operettas quoted or perhaps quoted, and one is about the beautiful homeland, I love my country, and then the other is the anti-patriotic, I really don't love my country so much, I, I love pretty girls. See, so uh, this is a very neat symmetry and uh, you know, we'll, we'll never know for sure what was going on, but what is for sure is that in four minutes, this fourth movement of Concerto for Orchestra uh, packs in so many illusions and uh, so many intriguing enigmas uh, as uh, very few other pieces by Bartók. So, uh, and then we're still not done with this movement because after this crude interruption, whether it's Shostakovich or Lehár or what have you, the nostalgic evocation of beautiful, splendid Hungary, the first one, da, 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 returns once again, much, much softer than the first time, as if through a veil, a memory of a memory. And then the innocent little intermezzo tune ends the movement as if dismissing the whole drama with a shrug of the shoulders. Any emigre could feel nostalgic and homesick for the country they left behind. But Bartók had another reason for feeling that way. His entire life's work was bound up with his homeland and its musical traditions. It was back in 1906 and he and his colleague Zoltán Kodai started crisscrossing the country in search of ancient peasant melodies, which revealed to them a hitherto unknown musical treasure that subsequently became the basis of their own compositions. The importance of this work went beyond the purely musical. 
by making the old peasant songs known to the entire country, Batok and Kodai pursued a mission of national education, and indeed a mission of redefining Hungarian cultural identity. So that's uh, some, some pretty big issues. Uh, Bartok had left behind thousands of recordings on hundreds of wax cylinders and thousands of pages of transcriptions and analyses of these materials. And he was deeply worried about the fate of his life's work. And rightly so, as it turned out. When Bartok was born, Hungary was part of the multi-ethnic Habsburg Empire and did not exist as an independent country until 1918. When it finally achieved independence in 1918, its territory was only one third of the size of pre-war Hungary due to the Treaty of Trianon, which following Austria-Hungary's defeat in World War I gave much of its territory to the neighboring countries. Under these circumstances, folk music was an important means of fostering national consciousness. Introduced into many schools and popularized through a, through a thriving choral movement, the, the ancient peasant music, once known only in the villages, became the property of the entire nation. Batok and Kodai were among the major driving forces behind these efforts, which was another reason why the bond Batok felt towards his homeland was very deep. But there was yet another side to Bartok's outlook and his personality. I and mean, he was very devoted to this, his homeland, but he was also a very international figure. As a composer, he was better appreciated abroad, where by the 1930s, most of his major works were premiered. Many conservative critics back home found his music too modern and too difficult, although he certainly had his enthusiastic champions as well. Bartok, long at home in the major musical centers of the West, he used to say he would go home to Paris. He had been contemplating emigration for years, and his concern about his aging mother was a major reason why he didn't realize those plans sooner. It was only after his mother had passed away in 1939 that he and his second wife, pianist Ditta Pastori, decided to leave. After an exploratory trip in the spring of 1940, they moved to the United States in the fall of the same year. Their son, Peter, followed them somewhat later. Batok's son from his first marriage, Bela Jr., already married at the time, stayed behind and spent his entire life in Hungary. So um, what was Bartok's life like in the United States? We can begin to answer this question by turning to his professional biography. As long as his health permitted, he and Ditta did a fair amount of touring in the United States, appearing with orchestras and in duo recitals in many cities coast to coast. But for various reasons, the reviews they got were less than stellar, as were the venues where, with a few exceptions, they appeared. Another activity, and the one he enjoyed the most, was his grant at Columbia University for the transcription of the Yugoslav epic songs collected by Milman Perry. But Milman Perry, the grant expired after less than two years, around the time when Bartok's health also began to fail. These were the rather unfavorable conditions under which the Bartoks lived when the Kusavitsky Commission came. But this is just the professional side of things. Uh, Another problem, I mean, his personal situation, I mean, his housing situation. In less than five years, they had at least three different addresses in New York. First, for a short time in Forest Hill, Queens, from where they moved to the Riverdale section of the Bronx into an apartment rented from an Italian immigrant with whom he conversed in Italian. He spoke seven or eight languages. The last New York address was in Midtown Manhattan around the corner from Carnegie Hall. But if you can believe this, the landlord refused to extend their lease and served them an eviction notice literally days before Bartok's death. So, so it was not a happy time uh, in general. But yet Bartok tried to live a full life in the United States, eager to understand the country as well as possible and to perfect his English, which was already excellent on arrival. 
He was a keen observer of the world around him. There are many amusing details in his correspondence from this time. He noticed and, and commented on everything from the fact that the keys in the lock turned in the opposite direction from Hungary, the novelty of the various kitchen gadgets that he had to get used to. He had never had a refrigerator in Hungary. He described his distaste for American bread, synthetic vanilla, and the sight of people chewing gum. All this is uh, written down in his letters. And I don't know how we're doing on time. Uh, there is a wonderful letter uh, that is not included in Peter Bartok's book that he wrote back to his two sons. Uh, the first Christmas he spent in America, December 24, 1940. And, uh, and this, this is uh, quite a, a long letter. Uh, well, I will just read uh, a, a couple of excerpts from it in the interest of time. He said, on December 7th, we moved into a furnished apartment. This was the one in Forest Hills. This is 16 kilometers from the center of New York, but the express subway stop is right in front of our door and we can be in the city in 20 minutes for five cents anytime. We are beginning to become Americanized, for instance, in our food. We have grapefruit for breakfast, cereal with exclamation point, with cream, brown bread with butter, eggs, bacon, or fish for breakfast. That's nothing like the Hungarian diet. Our main meal is between eight and 10 at night, raw carrots, lettuce, radishes, olives, etc with bread and butter, sometimes soup, sometimes meat, sometimes pasta. Again, it's not exactly how Hungarians eat. Words like yeast or cumin have caused some linguistic difficulties, but now we are past that. My head fills up with a lot of new words, the names of streets and subway stops, charts of train networks, tons of possibilities of changing trains, things absolutely necessary if you live here, but otherwise unproductive. Uh, we lived on the sixth floor, that is fifth, it explains the difference. Uh, there are no more floors above us. The hall or lobby is low, but long and wide, heated with sofas, small tables, permanent lights. Here are the residents' mailboxes. Everyone goes to get his own mail. I mean, this is so interesting. You know, he describes all these small details that you wouldn't even stop to think about to his two sons. And Peter was also still in Hungary at the time. And then he was so lucky, the concierge, Mr. Janoszko, a Slovak from near Kosice, he can still speak pretty good Hungarian. And of course, Slovak, which Bartok also spoke. He's been here for 30 years, widowed for 12 years. He has 11 living children, all of whom speak only English. I mean, it's re remarkable how, how he describes all this. Uh, one of his sons-in-law, a minor employee with the electric company, took us on an excursion to the, sh to the shore in his comfortable four-seat car. We stopped at their four-room apartment, which is equipped with all comforts, and they treated us to Janoszko made kochanya, or meat aspic, for lunch. Such are the offspring of concierges here he says to his sons. And, and then this is best I read one more paragraph because this is just too precious. We have been quite busy learning about various electric and gas contraptions, corkscrews, can openers, etc., as well as with means of transportation, but we're getting the hang of it. Sometimes there are mishaps though, as when the other day we wanted to go to the southernmost point in New York City, and I wasn't sure where to change trains. The signs are not quite conspicuous. They are sketchy and confusing. So we ended up riding back and forth on the ground for three hours until having run out of time, we returned home without having accomplished anything, with our tails between our legs, always underground. So uh, this is uh, for his observations of American life and his everyday life in New York City. 
So how are we on time? Because uh, I I wanted to to return to music just a little bit. Uh, his last major composition that he wrote after the concerto for orchestra, which I'm also sure you know, the third piano concerto, which uh, he hoped would launch Ditta's solo career when he would no longer be around. And this too was composed mostly at Saranac, although a crucial moment connects it to the other location in the mountains where Batok was sent by ASCAP to work and recover in the winter months, Asheville, North Carolina, where he stayed from December 1943 to April of 1944. And um, like the earlier work, the piano concerto is rich in intertextual allusions, but they are very different from those in the concerto for orchestra. There's even less folk music, and there's no question of operetta tunes or reactions to recent news, as in the case of Shostakovich. Rather, uh, the, the allusions, and the all commentators agree on this, are to the great classics, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, these gods of classical music whom Bartok revered beyond measure and to whom he was paying tribute at the end of his life. So uh, the, even the earliest reactions to the concerto emphasized its Mozartian clarity and lightness. The Bach-like fugue in the last movement is an equally unambiguous homage, as is most significantly the second movement, the Adagio Religioso, which strongly and unmistakably references the holy song of thanksgiving to a convalescent to the deity from Beethoven's string quartet in A minor, Opus 132. The relevance of the idea of convalescence to Bartok hardly needs to be stressed. In this movement though, Bato combines the Beethoven illusion with other materials, namely a chorale, that is a simple hymn-like melody with a simple chordal accompaniment. And then in the middle section of the movement, something even more remarkable, a series of sounds imitating nature. So we have religion and nature. And here's another near self quote because he wrote a famous piano piece, Music of the Night, uh, from the piano cycle Out of Doors, back in 1926. And, uh, and, and then here we have a, a bird song that he heard in North Carolina, which was later identified, and you can read this in Peter Bartok's book, as the rufous-sided Taui, the kind of New World Sparrow. So here is that uh, little excerpt from, from the piano concerto, and this is going to be the last excerpt, the last musical excerpt. Okay, so yapapam, yapapam, ping. You can find the, the, the musical notation in, in Peter's book with a photo of the bird in question. Uh, right here. You can see page 182. So, uh, the communion between man with a capital M and nature with a capital N. 
so this also ties in with earlier masterpieces as the Cantata Profana from 1930, in which the nine young men leave conventional society behind to choose a more authentic natural world to live in, the stags. Or the even earlier ballet, The Wooden Prince, 1917, in which a good fairy who rules over the forces of nature brings about the union of the prince and the princess. Much must have been on Bartok's mind during his long solitary walks in Asheville, North Carolina and Saranac Lake, New York. Most of it he didn't share with anyone. Mountains had always been very close to his heart. He used to spend many summer vacations in the Swiss Alps and these beautiful American landscapes must have affected him deeply. For him, they marked the end of a long journey that had begun half a world away in the succession of Hungarian towns and cities where he had grown up, of which interestingly not one remained part of Hungary after Trianon. One of Hungary's greatest poets, Endre Adi, uh, born four years before Bartók in a town that is likewise located in Romania, Romania now, uh, let me write it down for you. Uh, and the Adi, a very important poet, uh, who in one of his poems uh, speaks about a modest little stream that flows through his hometown. And by feeding ever larger rivers, the water of that little stream eventually reaches the ocean. It is a very powerful metaphor that seems to apply almost literally to the life and career of Bela Bartók. After all, he did reach and cross the ocean. And out of the songs of the modest villages he knew as a young man, he created a whole new world of sounds for the whole world to hear and enjoy. So uh, this is uh, pretty much what, what I wanted to say. But Mahela, if you could just put up that photo of Bartók uh, that, that we had at the beginning of this uh, file. Uh, let's, let's look at this, this photo because that is, yeah, this is such, such an incredible uh, photograph that captures so much of the essence of this man. And when I was in school in Budapest at the Liszt Academy, this picture was hanging on the wall. And the interesting thing about it is, is no matter where you are in the room, you always feel that his eyes are following you. His eyes are always on you. Uh, I, I, I tried this, you, you, you move to the left or to the right and, and is always looking at you somehow. It's, uh, it's a miracle, uh, but uh, but the very penetrating eyes uh, that you can't really get away from. So I certainly haven't been able to get away from from that and, and from his personality and from from his uh, life's work in all these years. So I don't know if there is time for any questions. We'd love to hear from you and. Uh, have a little conversation. Uh, if if there are questions, uh, I, I tried to talk about the music, but also about his life and uh, everything from from getting lost on the subway. Yeah, you have it. Isn't that isn't that a, it's an amazing? It's a well known photographer, Kata Kalman, who who did it. I mean, there are other photos, but this one is. Um, is really special. Um, so uh, so anyway, and I just I just want to share share this memory of, of the eye is always following me. So um, yeah. Uh, so so folks, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions, or you're welcome to put them in the chat as well, and I can read them. Oh, I just want to thank you for your the tour through the concerto for orchestra. That was wonderful. Thank to you. Hear all those tunes and how they fit together and what they meant. That was wonderful. Thank You're you. You're a great so teacher, Peter. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That's very kind.
It means a lot. Yeah, it, it, it's really amazing what what he put into that very short movement. Yeah. So. Um, are you are you teaching now? Are you still teaching? I am. I am still teaching at Bard College. And, Do you have um, anything online? I would love to hear more of your teaching. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. We we have returned to in person teaching, of course. Uh, we were online for a whole year during the pandemic, uh -huh. and it wasn't always so easy. I mean, no. it's, it, it, it's easier with, when you don't want anything back from the students, because uh, the, the minute you have to have them do homework or, uh, or, or respond or, 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 or do things, it's much harder when you're online and you don't have them sure. with in person. But uh, we managed somehow, but we learned how to use uh, Zoom. So this helps us now because we can always use this when we are not in the same place. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I mean, when we learned something, I, I mean, Zoom had been around, but who knew about it? I didn't. So uh, yeah, I mean, Bartok, you know, I'm fascinated by his mind, Never all the things he was interested in, all the things he yeah. noticed. Oh, yes, it's just charming and and yeah. and charming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he was a, a great mind, and he he really combined uh, you know the Hungarian tradition with the international tradition. So his his musical line uh, lineage goes back to Beethoven. I mean, he was. Uh, he was uh, his, his teacher's teacher's teacher studied with Beethoven. So there is a direct line mm -hmm. uh, connecting the two. But then we're going to the villages and collecting all this old uh, folk uh, material. It really it changed him. Mm -hmm. and, and then he, he is a perfect synthesis of East and West in a way. When I've done tours at the cabin, I look out the windows and I think of the birds that he must have heard when he was there. Yeah. And the view that, yes, right. And then he put birds in his music. He did. He did. And this, uh, this, this piano piece is in music about the insects also. He was very interested in insects. Yes, right. <laughs> I remember that from the book. You remember from that from book. the book? Yes. He, uh, Peter sent him an insect in a box. And they had great discussions about what this insect might be. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, those those insects they don't don't make a lot of sound, but they're crickets and other uh, more musical animals turn up in uh, in this piano piece. Mm. And then um, you know this the piano concerto, second movement, is also we we don't know you 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 go outside in the middle of the night and. And then you hear noises, and you're not sure where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, I think, that's the experience that he captures. They're kind of mysterious. Mm -hmm. they, they're maybe mm -hmm. maybe branches uh, rustling, uh, leaves rustling in the wind, or or really a, a, an insect or a frog, or uh, I don't know. You don't always know where it is all coming from, but um, but he captured that. In his music, and in this piano concerto, uh, with with the this other religious sounding melodies before and after, it's just just such a such a spiritual statement. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, to me, he is uh, really one of the greatest in the twentieth century, and I'm not alone, and not I don't think I'm partial or biased when I say that. <laughs> so um, anyway, but um, but this uh, this letter, I don't know why why he didn't put that letter in, in his book. There are many, many more because his part two, the American uh, part of the correspondence begins in 42. And this is uh, Christmas 1940. And he 
the, the, the meticulousness with which he, he, I mean, letters were so hard to write and it took so long to, to cross the ocean, except, uh, especially during the war. So he says here, dear Bela and Peter, his two sons, I write to the two of you in two copies. I send one of the copies to you, Bela, today. I will mail the other one to you, Peter, in a week. If you, Bela, receive yours, show it to Aunt Irma and then send it on to Peter, unless he has already forwarded his own copy to you. And you, Peter, forward your copy to Bela, unless you have already received his. I mean, this is like, a, I mean, a lawyer wouldn't be able to put it more precisely mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with an eye on all the, uh, the potential possibilities of who receives the letter first. And then, and then he goes on and when, when he received the letter and when the letter was sent and when it arrived, and, uh, which one arrived and which one didn't arrive. I mean, there's a, half a page just on, on that. Yeah. <laughs> just a, a letter about letters. And it's, it's incredible. So, uh, but, but that also this, this very scientific analytical mind which is the same mm -hmm. mind that analyzed all the folk songs, uh, the same mind that uh, you know, looked at the insects and everything else. I mean, he was mm -hmm. really interested in taking things apart. Yeah, extremely yeah. keen observation yeah. of everything around him. Yeah, and then there's this other book, the Agatha Facet, you know that one? It was mm -hmm. the first, first published uh, under the title The Naked Face of Genius. And mm -hmm. then that, that was a little bit too, uh, too personal, and then I think it was changed to Bartok's Years in America. I think uh, it's another one. Well, this is a Hungarian-born woman who was uh, living in the United States, and she was a friend of Ditta's, one of Bartok's wives, and uh, so she was able to observe the great observer <laughs> from up close. So and Peter, um, I, Peter, I just want to thank you. I just want to jump in while you're mentioning books. And um, I know some folks are probably needing to get going here. So I, I don't I want to kind of wrap things up a little bit. But um, I wanted to mention your book. Oh, which, uh, it's how we found that. you. <laughs> this is speaking of our talk books. This is an incredible book and oh, um, totally worth worth a good read. Um, it's interesting because it's a compilation of essays by um, many people that uh, normally wouldn't, you know, wouldn't come our way that are they're 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 uh, a lot of them are Hungarian writers and and uh, just really interesting. I mean, it was a lot of it completely over my head, but I do think I learned some things. So <laughs> thank you for this. I'll I'll put this title in the in the chat thank here. For you. That was that was a lot of work. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so um, long time ago. Well, I encourage everyone to stay. Um, tuned because we do have one more bar talk program coming up, um, not by people who are experts on bar talk, just by historic Saranac Lake staff who uh, don't know nearly as much as you do, Peter. But we do have some amazing art artifacts to show everybody. So oh. um, stay tuned for that talk. And, and Mahela, I'll pass it over to you and let you um, close it out for everybody. Yeah, I think and those, and those are the, the artifacts that will be in the museum, the new museum. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, but on that, folks. Uh, on that note, I think we'll wrap up, folks. Um, I know Amy's putting the title of Peter's book in the chat, but I will send out a link to the recording of this program tomorrow, and I'll be sure to put that information in that email when it goes out as well. If anybody um, is interested in that, and uh, so thank you all for coming, and thank you so much, Peter, for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for meeting everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you again for the invite. Good evening. Bye -bye. Really enjoyed.